Well, as we said, this is Nate. This is uh, Nate Mauger. He's our Wintern, which happens when you combine winter with intern. Um, and we were so impressed by him during the winter quarter that we asked him to stick around for the spring. Um, and now we're trying to, to badger him into staying around for the summer as well. He is an active member of Students for Free Thought at The Ohio State University, where he is a student of anthropology and geography. Nate's experience is traveling with Students for Free Thought to and the Thomas Society, an OSU campus ministry, to New Orleans this spring break for a service project, gave him a new perspective on the benefits of cooperation with faith groups. With graduation on the horizon, Nate hopes to stave off unemployment by going to grad school to study at GIS. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. So uh, I feel like it, it's weird having everyone like off in that direction, but uh, I'll try to compensate here. Let's see. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. I'm kind of torn this week. I feel like we've uh, already covered a lot of what I'm going to cover in this lecture in terms of, or lecture, like discussion, I guess, uh, in terms of working with different groups, um, working with off-campus groups, secular groups off-campus, and uh, working with groups in general. But at the same time, I think it's good because it ties in very well to what I'm talking about today. Um, so I think in many ways it can uh, lead into this discussion. Um, here's a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, especially, there's issues that affect working with faith groups. Is uh, what what uh, causes hesitancy in working with faith groups? Like, why do secular groups have uh, issues with working with faith groups, and what's been holding them back? Um, what are the benefits of working with a faith group? Uh, how can you use that to your advantage in terms of uh, growing your group and getting interest in your uh, in your group and events? Um, how does one go about finding strategies for creating a relationship with a faith group? So what are the specific steps you can take to kind of cultivate a relationship with a faith group and uh, how the best ways to go about that? And um, it feels like often that conflict is inevitable with groups of faith that you might bring to your events or that you might go to their events. So how would you deal with that kind of situation? And in the middle here, after, uh, after we discuss the benefits, I'm going to have a, uh, about a 10-minute video of the leaders of the Students for Free Thought at OSU and the leader of the Thomas Society, which are the two groups that went down to New Orleans. So this talk should try and tie in um, the New Orleans trip along with uh, these other issues. So I think... A lot of the reason um, secular groups have trouble getting excited about working with faith groups is that they expect that they will be proselytized to. And it's not an unreasonable expectation. Um, this will happen if you do not choose the right group. So you've got to be mindful of the groups you approach and be willing to search for a while. I, uh, a specific example of this is when I went down to New Orleans, um, we went down with a very moderate, more liberal religious group. Um, and they were much easier to deal with. But when we were walking down on Bourbon Street, we uh, were confronted with people who were much more militant, and they were holding signs and telling us we were going to hell. Um, this is extremely troubling, especially if you are trying to get this group involved with uh, you know, your events on campus. Uh, it won't work well. So this expectation is not um, unfounded. I think a lot of times secular groups uh, perceive that they will not share any kind of goals with uh, with the group that they're inviting to their events. Um, I love this picture because it shows uh, us down in New Orleans working on a basketball court. Um, and this is kind of an homage to Iwo Jima, I guess, or the... Uh, and it's funny, the guy in the red shirt is actually like a foreign exchange student from Russia, so I guess he wasn't into the whole patriotic uh, aspect of this. <laughs> but um, but I, I, we do have shared values. I think uh, some religious groups actually are searching for truth. Whether they're searching for it in the right way or not, uh, that can be debated. Uh, Ashley Paramore, uh, the leader of Students for Free Thought, discusses that a little bit in the video. But um, I think, you know, that attention to service projects like this is also something that... Uh, that, I guess, brings these groups together. So, um, in many ways, that can be very beneficial. Um, and I think also working with groups of faith can trouble secular groups in that they think that if they bring them in, that they are lending credibility to their message. And I think that's also probably an issue that people overblow a little bit. I mean, it's not... It's not so much that you're lending credibility to the message as much as you're initiating a dialogue. And I think if you're strategic about the way you discuss topics at your meetings, um, you can kind of avoid this 
perception that they are imparting to you some kind of wisdom um, rather than just having a discussion. Uh, a lot of ministries... I, I'm aware they, they want to reach out to secular groups because they think it's a part of their witnessing strategy. Um, these are groups you should also avoid because they're not in it to establish a dialogue with you. They're in it to win you over. And uh, that's, that's definitely not what you want. So clear communication is the key here. When you're searching out a group, make sure that they're a group that, uh, that will not try and do that to you. So... Uh, here are some of the benefits of working with a faith group on your campus. Uh, it dispels a lot of negative stereotypes. You're never going to have the opportunity to convince um, faith groups that you aren't the kind of person who will eat a baby if you don't uh, you know, have them over and make them realize that you're there to discuss important issues. Not just issues related to the secular movement, but issues sometimes related to what they're interested in. So uh, I think uh, this cartoon illustrates some of the... Um, disturbing stereotypes of atheists. Um, I uh, particularly like uh, what's in his pocket, assorted lint of, or the seeds of Satan. So, um, but uh, yes, this, uh, this appeals to me greatly. Um, they can stare and notice his Pop-Tarts before the omnipresence of God. <laughs> like that. So anyway, um, another benefit of working with a faith group on your campus is, uh, is um, jointly planned events can bring in people with different perspectives. And also, this picture here, you might be wondering why, why I'm showing this. Uh, does this person look like an atheist or a Christian to you? No idea. No idea. He was both, in fact. Uh, this is Mike Riggs. He is the president of Students for Free Thought, and he actually was a member of the Thomas Society for probably four or five years. He was a very devoted Christian, but he is also a, like a Bible scholar. He amazes me all the time with his biblical knowledge, and he... And in working with the Thomas Society, he uh, and coming to Students for Free Thought, he managed to deconvert, and now he's an incredible ac uh, asset to our group. Um, and because of our interaction, he has the opportunity to uh, to use his biblical knowledge as kind of a weapon for our side, which is uh, <laughs> which is a fantastic um, benefit to working with faith groups. So you know, the opportunity to kind of deconvert people. <laughs> seems kind of sinister, but... <laughs> um, that's part of your witnessing strategy. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> wow, let's get away from that. <laughs> um, I guess uh, regular collaboration with religious groups can lead to service projects, and this is what I'm going to kind of narrow my focus here. Most of what, uh, what I've talked about so far is kind of a broad advice for working with faith groups, but um, what we worked on specifically during the spring was the uh, service trip to New Orleans. Um, this, uh, the picture here of the uh, rather uncomfortable-looking atheist and the uh, rather happy-looking Christian is uh, <laughs> somewhat disturbing to me. But, uh, but I think uh, it illustrates that atheists and Christians can work together. We had this... Uh, we were gutting houses all week, was what we were doing. We actually gutted uh, two, two and a half houses, I think. And um, I think this picture here of this calendar is like very eerie to me because uh, when we were getting these houses, what, some of these houses had never been touched since 2005. And uh, this calendar actually went into this house. It was f this house was full of this woman's stuff. She had died there. She was 80 years old and she, she literally died in her doorstep as the hurricane hit. And uh, she wouldn't leave because she was afraid of looters coming. And we went in there and we found all of her stuff and we found this calendar that was set to August 2005. And it just, it really hit home to me that you know, there's a lot of uh, in incredible service opportunities that atheists and Christians can work together on, and um, you know, it's great for publicity too. I think for your group, if you can explain to people that, you know, you can you can work together on these projects and you can do a lot of good, especially in New Orleans. And I know the Harvard uh, Secular Society went to New Orleans. Um, what kind of work did you do? Oh, actually, it was the, uh, the grad student group. A grad student group. Our grad student group. We um, we. Uh, Reestablished an educational museum garden um, that, that had been closed since 2005. We, we got it just about ready to open again. They'd been working on it for some time, but we finished it up. Um, that was a museum to the African culture in New Orleans. Okay. We uh, we did a number of sort of you know sort of small projects, graffiti removal, that sort of thing, and then we we did sort of a habitat project for um, an African American woman um, who is a humanist who um, had been her own contractor and restored her own house. She got cancer um, and wasn't able to do her work. She got defrauded by the contractor she hired. Oh, wow. We went in there and we made a wonderful relationship with her. 
she invited us back, you know, um, and, and, you know, also happened to be a humanist, and that's how we got hooked up with her. That's a great, great opportunity. I mean, it, it's, it's so troubling to see how much there still is to do down in New Orleans. I mean, there's still so much opportunity, so I think this is like a great service project idea for any humanist or uh, secular group to go on, you know, even today. There's always going to be stuff to do down there, so... Um, Here's actually a video of the uh, the two leaders of the student groups. I, I'm moving a little slow, so we'll just jump right into it then. Um. You know, uh, I think it's more of my approach of let's see what we have in common and things that we can do together and maybe shake things up a little bit, especially with Christians and atheists. Um, those are two groups that never do anything together unless it's a debate. Um, so we, we were trying to figure out, I, I, I tried to figure out what we could do in common, things that we could have more fruitful discussions because usually in a debate, a formal debate, no, no side gets convinced of the other side's position. And so, um, I think we were looking to try to go deeper with the dialogue rather than just the cold, sterile atmosphere of a, of a debate. So I've been working within the secular community for quite a few years now, and especially within the campus communities. And working on campus, you run into a lot of different religious groups. A lot of them that tend to think that you're an immoral person, um, that, you know, I eat babies, and what have you. So I figured that the best way to kind of help counter these stereotypes is to actually work more and more with religious groups, and that's when I started working with John. Revolutionary idea. I sent an email. <laughs> what? I just, crazy, crazy. Uh, I did. I just sent an email and said, hey, let's get together. And, um, Talk this out. I, I, you know, it was a very general email. It's like I don't know what we can do, what it can look like, but let's just get together and have lunch and figure it out. And Ashley and I kind of just, I think it was more. I think a lot of it had to do that we hit it off so well as friends, and so that was probably the big building point there. So you were kind of looking for an atheist group to connect with. Yeah, yeah, okay. and contrary to popular opinion, the Thomas Society was never about outreaching to atheists. It was more for Christians who are struggling with their faith, who had questions, and to present an honest forum to do that. And it's not that we didn't want atheists to come, which is it wasn't necessarily our focus. And mm -hmm. it was sort of a, hey, let's do something with these guys. Let's let's figure out something. Maybe one or two events, and it just kind of really exploded from there in a good way. So, if you will, um, it was yeah. fate. Uh, before I even contacted anybody, um, toward when I was taking over. Uh, as the chair for the Students for Free Thought, um, I actually got an email before the fall from John wanting to work with atheist groups. And I was a little bit skeptical at first, but I figured, hey, why not? The first trip was was subject of conversation right at the beginning. Um, I think that was the attraction for Ashley to, to really maybe connect with our group at first. Um, so I definitely think that was mm. that was there from the beginning. So I think that maybe helped kind of start the centrifuge of circling ideas, uh, kind of coalescing around that that trip. And okay. so even though only like six or seven atheists went, that was the whole idea of going on that trip helped bring things together. I think we were bouncing off different ideas of what we could do together. We established that we didn't want to do debates right away. Um, one of the things that I mentioned right away is that we really wanted to do a service trip and in particular I brought up New Orleans because a student group at Champaign-Urbana had done it with Campus Crusade for Christ the year before right. and so basically he happened to know that one of the Presbyterian churches up in Westerville, Ohio uh, was going on a trip but we kind of planned on doing it right away from there so we had no interaction or working with each other before we even started this trip it was only what I knew from John passion for truth. Mm -hmm. um, all of us believe that there is a truth to be had. Um, now, we disagree what that truth is, but we 
we both can agree that there is a truth and we're passionate about finding it, whatever that road may lead. And we, we try to be honest about it. Um, so I, I think passion for truth and honesty is probably the two big things. The biggest thing is we both want to know the truth, I think. Um, also, when it comes to more of the charitable stuff, we all want to do things to make the world a better place now. Whether or not our motivations are the same or different, we could argue that. But I think, you know, all in all, we both want the truth and we want the world to be a better place. That was my biggest concern. Um, you know, bridging, bridging cultures is always hard, and, and atheists and Christians have different cultures. Even though we have, on a superficial level, we're the same. We all root for Ohio State here and, <laughs> and, and all those things. Uh, but, but the way we communicate can often be strange to each other. And so I was worried about when you get in a, in a pressure-type situation on a service project trip where you're working hard and things may not be going right, that uh, that would bring those tensions to the surface. So I, I definitely had concern for on both sides, not just atheists, but Christians as well. But in your experience, has there ever been any conflict on these trips? Any like meaningful? The, on the last two trips? Yeah. Uh, no. 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 Um, and I've been on eight service project trips, uh, most of them which with, with Christian groups, and there was less conflict uh, in the last two trips to New Orleans than I think in any of the other trips that I've been on. Um, Do you think maybe the groups were kind of just mindful of, you know, making sure that they yeah. didn't, yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. It makes people more mindful of, uh, more respectful towards each other. Mm -hmm. Whereas Christians, you, you start, if you're all one group or the other, you start taking each other for granted and you start fighting amongst each, amongst each other. On the trip, I wasn't too terribly concerned about conflict, um, or at least from a personal standpoint. Now, mind you, in every Christian and atheist group, you're going to have a person who is going to be the, oh, what would be a good comparison, the Dawkins or the, um, you know, Jerry Falwell of every group. And I was worried that we might have a little bit of that, but honestly, everybody from both the first and second trip that we went on, I think, was very respectful to each other, and there was some conversations that we had about religion, but it was never any, you know, put up your dukes and mm. let's go fight each other. I think it makes, first of all, it makes it more interesting. Um, mm. it, it makes it more... Uh, alive and more real um, when you're dealing with people who don't agree with you mm. um, and, and it's more satisfying because you, you go you know we're, we're relying on our common humanness to get some good things done in New Orleans and we, we did a lot of good stuff down there and so uh, I, but but really personally I have to say it just makes it more interesting you know, the conversations are more interesting and uh, it sharpens us and, and prevents Christians on the Christian side from being lazy I think it's really important to work with religious groups in general and on these service trips for a couple of reasons. Going back to the whole uh, baby eating stereotype, um, it sh goes to show, especially when you're working with more conservative religious groups, that we are good people too. We're not going around eating babies. We want to help make the world a better place as well. So I see that as a huge advantage to doing service trips um, with religious groups or even if you're going alone. Um, piggybacking onto a religious group that's already down there, I think that could be really useful. Because we always hear about, you know, atheists being this discriminated against minority. Mm. Um, that, you know, religious people are constantly bashing us and everything, but when we turn around and we're not willing to work with religious people or show them that, you know, we kind of adding care about fuel the to the fire too. a little bit. Exactly.
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the rest of this because um, I feel like we're probably running a little short on time. Um, so we'll just try and move on here. Um, so basically now we'll discuss like how, how to really get a relationship going with a, uh, a, a religious student group, um, how to get in contact. And I know it's probably never going to be as easy as you know John and Ashley made it be. Uh, they just made a phone call and it worked out really well. Uh, but you're probably going to have to do a lot more work to get this done. And you're going to want to make sure that you pick the right group or at least that you search long enough so that you don't get trapped uh, working with a group that uh, you're not going to agree with. So the, one of the best ways to do that is to like make phone calls and look at your uh, student organization's websites. They, uh, they have incredible resources. Uh, they have email addresses. You can send an email. Um, and uh, I think another really important key is to go and visit these student groups meetings. So kind of feel out what they're talking about, what the issues that they care about are, and uh, try and figure out how to coordinate uh, your interests. Um, oh look, I don't have the PowerPoint going anymore. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> much as uh, Liz talked about, one of the best ways to uh, encourage people to frequent your events is to uh, give people food. You know, I, I found that um, the times I've been best received in events is the times I bring donuts or pizza. And uh, as you can see, this little cat loves his pizza. So. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a definitely a great way to endear yourself to people who would normally disagree with you. It's hard to disagree with someone who's bringing you sweet donuts and things of that nature. So let's keep that in mind. Um, and it's, it's important to maintain a respectful and honest cha channel of communication between the groups. Um, proselytizing might happen at your meetings, but they should not, it should not happen, and you should stop it in its tracks because you're still a secular group. You're not here to compromise your values and you're not here to give them a podium to discuss, you know, their passion for Christ, right? You know what I mean? They're not, you're not there to, I guess, give them this platform. Um, and I've had so many times at SFF, people will start preaching at your meetings. They'll come and they'll hijack your meeting and you, you have to really just stop them. I mean, I've seen uh, our student leaders get up and say, listen, you can't do this. You have to stop. And that's that's really the only thing you can do. So, and a lot of that ties into picking the right group to work with. So you don't want to have an issue where um, the, the group you picked decides that they need to witness to you every week. Um, that's important. Um, talked a little bit about managing conflict uh, before. And you're going to disagree. That's not the issue. But you want to keep it civil. You know, you don't want people to be, uh, as Ashley put it, putting up their dukes to fight you. You know, so make sure you keep it civil and understand that uh, you can argue respectfully, but in the end, your ideas should win in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, they should rise to the top. If you're right, you don't have to be like attacking people ad hominem style. Leave that to the religious. You, you don't need to take that strategy. Um, and lastly, it's important to understand the context of the uh, events you're holding. Um, on the left here, you can see a debate. I think there's really two kinds of events. There's social events and service projects, and then there's there's debates, and debates are places where you should, you know, have a firm grasp of what you believe, what you're standing for, and you should feel comfortable arguing with people in a civil way. But in service projects, I don't think it's necessarily the most appropriate place to have those kinds of discussions. Um, you really should be focusing on improving the human condition, or, you know, if you're out drinking, you should enjoy the company of other people, whether you disagree with them or not. Uh, and it can be a great way to kind of foster um, a good interaction with a group that you would normally not agree with, and it can make them more willing to, to come to your debates if they feel like they know you well, they feel like they're more comfortable with you, and it could lead to more service projects. So it's kind of a cycle, um, and I guess the goodwill should feed off of, uh, feed off of your ability to, um, to uh, work with the group. So anyway, that's... Uh, more or less the end, except for this, apparently. Uh, uh, debates, debates are good, but people aren't going to come back all the time uh, just to debate you. So make sure that you uh, have the right group to work with and uh, take time to focus on the issues in which you can find common ground. And I'm just about out of time, so there you go. Okay, uh, Paul, go ahead. Um, my question was, like, you, you said to, when possible, avoid... Uh, groups that you think might pro might try to proselytize to you a lot and stuff like that. Yeah. But what do you what do you think would be the best way to handle a situation if, say, 
you got involved with a group that you didn't think would have, you'd have an issue with that, but you end up do. Yeah. And they, like, are inviting you to other events and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, like, what, what do you think would be the best, best way to, like, turn them down? I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I think... Uh, first of all, as a preventative measure, it's important to sit down with the leaders of the group beforehand and just get a really good feel for what their goals are and what <coughs> their ideas are for uh, your kind of joint events so that you can try and avoid that issue as much as possible. But if you're stuck in that situation and you have a meeting where you just like suddenly realize, oh God, like I'm, I'm working with someone who like is just constantly berating me with this and I can't do this anymore, you just have to cut it off. I mean, you're still a secular group and I don't want to sound like I'm compromising too much here with this because I, I know that that can come across as kind of a... Uh, <laughs> in a way, I, I feel like the secular movement probably feels... Uh, very negatively towards working with faith yeah, groups. No, no, I, I understand that yeah. you have to cut it off. But what would you say would be the best way, way, way to do it? I mean, you, I, I don't know that you have to be all that polite about it. You set forth in the beginning that you want to have you know, a good discussion and increase the dialogue. And if they're not interested in having the dialogue, then you shouldn't have to be interested in you know, worrying about their feelings with this. You know? <laughs> I mean, if they truly believe that you're going to burn forever in hell and they're trying to make that clear to you, then why should you, you know, have to sit and kind of worry about their feelings? I don't I agree. So, anyway, do we have time for more questions or is that... Oh, one more. <clears throat> one more? I, I, I was just going to... I mean, we had, a, some, we had an experience like this with our trip to New Orleans. We were going to do it completely... Um, planned it completely together with uh, an evangelical Christian group here. Right? Yeah. And we were on our way to doing so. Um, when we found that we had, we, you know, we liked them very much, but we weren't able to plan the trip as equals. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't an opportunity for us to have as much say on the trip as they were. So we, we did have to, at that point, cut it off. We said we were going to go and take our own separate trip at this point. Right. Um, but we maintained a respectful communication with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we weren't rude about it, and we explained to them why it was that we, you know, we just felt we needed our own, uh, you know, self determination. We ended up spending about a, a, a day, you know, about a little less than a day with them <coughs> down there. Okay. Um, where we had some really you know, profitable discussions, but you know, you can say no to, to what's, you know, to what's beyond your your, your boundary. No, I. Um, Oh. Sorry, I just want to say real quick too. Uh, thank you, first of all, for a great presentation. Um, and thank if you. you are interested in doing this kind of work, the interface before has a lot of resources. So talk to me. I'm happy <coughs> to uh, get you connected with the right people. Sure. Uh, all right. We really. All right, yeah. Sorry. We had more time, but yeah. Okay. Uh, move on to Andrew. But thank you very much, Nate. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you.